let's get it on. So, um, this was my first book, and I'm going to try to read mostly from this book, but it is, um, like most first books, it deals with all of your childhood stuff. And so I'm going to be taking you guys way back, over 70 years sometimes, to um, the South. Dark white blues. Moonless at midnight, daddy out on the lake with a gig and a Rayovac flashlight. I hum like yesterday's fried chicken. No ear for music. I am tone deaf as the frogs. We will kill and eat for tomorrow's supper. Mother sleeps in the rock house, dreaming of beagles. She cried with daddy's nasty castle of beagles all this afternoon. While we floated on the lake, the crickets and cicadas relentlessly humming, mosquitoes buzzing the same note in our ears as the croaking of the splashing bullfrogs who search with bulging eyes for their supper. Mama lost the baby last night after supper and screamed in tune with the howls of daddy's beagles. This place is poison, the water moccasins in this lake, she finally spoke. Flat as you please, no hum, no melody, little breath left, no ears, no eyes, a kind of death with frogs. In Sunday school, they had told me about the locusts and the frogs, and I'm looking at their legs and thinking of plagues for supper. The teacher didn't say anything about a plague of beagles. I muse as we carry out frog leg and green tomato picnic down to the lake. Dusk again, and as we eat, the insects begin to hum the blues of our lives into our waiting ears. Mama spoke to Daddy, for Christ's sake, open your ears. We let them fill up with the lamentation of the frogs, like Lady Day wailing, hungry for love, and they for supper, like the blind boys of Alabama, Daddy's beagles fill a sweet harmony. Even the lake offers a soft bass, more than humming. Our stomachs no longer rumble, growl, or turn, but our hearts are as empty as our ears are full. You know how the sound suddenly stops? A frog belts a lonely lyric, hungry for the dead and her supper, the backup and the slow chorus from Mama and the Beagles. Tomorrow she will load us in the car and leave Daddy and the lake. No, no, I'm, I'm not turning on the light yet. So I'm staying dark. Um, yeah, well, you see, this is how it goes. So Eloise's poem has the mama losing the baby, and it made me um, go through my pile here and pull up um, one about my mama losing her babies. And well, it's a love poem, and you know, as love stories go, it always ends up with grief, one goes before the other, and the stronger the love, the deeper the grief, right? So, um, this one is called, oh, come on. Yeah, and that's my son, his wife, and my son, Dean. I'll explain what that means. Um, Safe space for your front <laughs> by Maxine. <laughs> so
So now that they've arrived, what we, I'm switching gears again. It's still about the baby. But um, my baby and my other baby, who is his wife, they're both here. And my Samdin, Samdin is the Guyanese Creole word for the mother of your daughter-in-law. So she is, she's my Samdin, and my daughter-in-law's father would be my Samdin. So it's our family. Um, so he's here, and I'm staying with the, the baby uh, theme. In this case, this baby was six years old and told his father, I'm, I'm looking for a point. Um, he said, Daddy, I love mommy more than you. <laughs> <laughs> And he was saying this to a man <laughs> who had a ready palm, you know. He was ready and always ready to apply the rod of correction to the seat of learning. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I had to um, get creative. So let me see if I could. I know the poem is here. Um, This group is small, just go ahead. We like family, it's, it's here. As soon as I pull it up, let's hope uh, it was worth, worth the wait. Um, oh man, here it is, okay. This is called, from, thank you, thanks yeah. Eloise. From bridge onto bridge onto dot, dot, dot. Years ago, I bridge the gap between innocence, which exists to dwell only in truth, and my husband's ready anger when our six-year-old said, Daddy, I love mommy more than you. Because I used to live far inside her where you can't go. <laughs> Resulting silence was the calm before a storm from a father who could not abide being bested by his own son. Let's read a book, I said. And off we went to read about bridges around the world. Today, I'm viewing bridges in a fresh way. I wonder if each of my three sons entered the universe via his own bridge, or if the same bridge recycled every time. I imagine a bridge that circles itself, bearing a soul on its journey from a nothing to a something, as he rounds out his existence on his way back to where he began. A nothing, knowing this new beginning as he is known by it. He has become part of all that is. An enlightened absence. My son was right to affirm that in her creating, eternity touches the woman deeper than anyone can go. No mystic can unweave the mystery between this flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood. This baby, whose cells I may carry inside of me for the rest of my life. This baby, my body has known so fully that when I finally meet him, skin to skin, milk to new stomach, I have no conscious knowledge of who he is or what he will become. All I know is that he is here because nature longed for itself. And I was volunteered to bring him in and raise him in the way he should go. My son, I did not say this then, 
but I'm saying it now. My daughter, may every bridge the two of you cross sway just enough to remind you to dance every day, to remind you to stay awake all the time, and to help you stay balanced with each sway. And may every bridge you cross continue to bring you closer home to your essential selves. Latitudinal. My grandfather left Texas on a cattle boat when he was 13, knowing full well there were four directions, latitude, longitude, altitude, and gender. No fool he, he used the Southern Cross to find his way. When he crossed the equator, the sea was less salty, but not his tears. I was born breech, the umbilical cord round my neck, spit into my grandfather's hands at 32 and three quarters degrees north latitude, a world of red clay, piney woods, hydrangeas, camellias, bougainvillea, magnolia, called opalica. I know how to travel feet first. When my latitude stretched out from me running east, over the place of my lost virginity, past Charleston, and slipping through the Sargasso Sea, I pretended to be damaged. The earth was spinning. I hit hard in Morocco and slid under the Marrakesh Express, plunging into the Sahara, dipping in and out of Homer's wine-dark sea into Palestine. The roots of the blood orange tree dug into my latitude. It would be many years before I measured the circumference, but I would, and marry the son of a Jew, son of a Jew, and so on, back to the beginning. I sail through the saline, sandy deserts into the fertile crescent. I would never bear my own child, no help from compasses there where in the name of family honor, girls are being murdered. I trace the route through mountains, Kashmir, high Himalayan peaks. Tibet, where babies are killed for being born female. Past Shanghai, Izu Trench, Musician Seamount, over faults where fish with no eyes swim. I learned to manage ebb and flow. It was, I was hot and thirsty when I passed through Tijuana and Mexicali into the desert home stretch, past the Babago woman holding the baby she loves. I saw cantaloupes growing in the Pecos and sp spied the place where my daddy would total his car, hitting a huge sow near my, old, my other grandfather's house in Louisiana. I crossed the Mississippi at Tallulah and headed home to Alabama on through Utah, E-U-T-A-W, where I joined the NAACP, and my cousin died from a kick in the head from a horse. I learned that the very same place can house choice and happenstance. I skidded over wet and dry earth, naked, my bones, my sextant, a female born on a dangerous line, trying to position herself in starlight. On my latitude, men have thrown acid in women's faces. I cannot fathom why it takes generations for our skin to adjust to latitude. I was born full of tears, and like God, I have eyes. Okay, so your line girls are babies killed from being born girls yeah. brought me back here to where <clears throat> babies are killed just for going to school 
So I have to do this. So our, our poems, um, you just came in. The way we're reading, our, we let the poems talk to each other. So as she's reading, I plan for this one, then the other one, then the other one. And one says, no, you're going to stay with me. So, yeah. so I'm calling this obsolete headlines. It's an uh, incomplete poem, which will remain incomplete. It's several couplets uh, numbered. I'll skip the numbering. They're just headlines. And it's for the children who have started school again this year in the United States of America, and for the rest of us who will be watching the news daily to see which school and how many kids were slaughtered again. Obsolete headlines. Teachers placed on probation for demanding students wear bulletproof vests to school. Students suspended for not wearing bulletproof vests to school. Parents arrested for beating their children to wear bulletproof, bulletproof clothing to school. Second grader collapses under the weight of his bulletproof vest and backpack. Parents face child abuse charges. Tenth grader handcuffed for sneaking Kevlar vest shield into school building. Eighth grader swallows bullet, claims it works like a flu shot. Emergency rooms struggle to cope with bullet swallowing epidemic. Center for Disease Control studying bullet swallowing surge among America's school children. Tenth grader steals father's bullets and trades them for lunch at school. Bullet packs fund research to coat bullets with mild laxatives hoping the children will ship the bullets out after they've been shot. <coughs> Last one. Teacher fired for beginning class with prayers for protection to Jesus, Moses, Athena, Shiva, the U.S. flag. along the creek. At next glance, he was transformed into a boy who strode out onto the road. Perhaps like the Japanese crane maiden, he was adopted by a couple long childless like my husband and me. This bird, just become boy, just bathed in bright, bright water, has come into a lather of sunlight. Other children will sense his difference, something of the heron, some memory of feathers. Maybe the gray around the eyes will betray him. When the curved finger of the new moon beckons, if he survives into manhood, he might translate the music of birds revealing the meanings. He could make a song so true and lucid, we would all be transformed. Okay. Um talk about transformation. I think this poem, you, you'll see, I think I was transformed by the end of the poem. It's just a fun one. I, the title is, 
It's ice cream o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> On a windy summer afternoon in Frieden Hoop, Mr. Jack Roop is singing across the road, ice cream cone, fudge sickle, popsicle custer, come and get it. I grab the money, forget to say thanks, and my mom warns me in staccato, stay in front of the yard. I run down the long path between house and road, planning to obey so I could buy more ice cream in two weeks when Mr. Jag will return with his rickety cart and the antique freezer powered by giant blocks of ice he buys from the ice factory. As if guided by its own brain, my right leg thrust itself forward in defiance. Mr. Jack roars, wait right there girl, your mother would kill me. He brings me over my favorite, vanilla. Again, I forget to say thank you and begin to lick like it's my only meal in forever. Like the first lick, let me taste joy and the rest must live up to that. I was licking like, that's how you pay homage to the gods of ice cream. <laughs> I walk back to the house, climb the stairs, sit on the landing for a few last licks before trying to describe this marvel to my mother. Mommy, lick this cone and see if your brain will start talking to itself and your stomach will shake faster and faster and breeze will blow from behind your navel and your eyes will open this big, you show her and many more things, mommy, but I forget. She takes the cone, thanks me, does not tell me there's nothing left for her to lick. She sticks her tongue into the shell, takes a few seconds then tells me I'm right. She can feel everything I just felt. It's ice cream o'clock, I squealed. Loud giggles. It's ice cream o'clock, my mother chuckles. I try every year to write myself a birthday poem. And this is one from back when this book was being created. And um, many of us at, at the press have been edited by Baron Wormser, and he calls this my signature poem. I wish I hadn't written it so early. I'm still looking to write another one that can replace it. <laughs> the Warbler Song. The emphatic, hurry, 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 over a burst of wheezy, 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 its name chilled somewhere far off, amid the cheery chatter of cheery, cheery, chip, chippity, sweet, ditchity, chip, 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 woo, with you, with you, two, 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 we do, woo. Something is whistling, whistling a lispy, dreamy, zure, zure, hurry, hurry. A male is singing. Sweet you, sweet you, sweet you. A buzzy beer, beer, beer. Zoo, zee, zoo, zoo. A female cries, husky and emphatic. Witchy, witch, witch, see it? Followed by the males, rigorous. See, see, see it? A bright, please, please, please to meet you. Tita, 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 teet. The new little voice chants. She is a girl child. Z up with you, with you, trilling chip, chippy, sugar sweet, sugar sweet. This five June morning, Zurezi Zoo, a female birth to female. Which, which, see it? <laughs> So well, um, I'm staying with the nature theme. You're not going to hear the birds, but hopefully I paint a little picture where you can see them. 
I, I can't uh, compete with that. It's not a competition anyway, but you know what I mean. Um, so this one is called Mazaruni River, Guyana. It's Saturday morning, and the sun has not yet made its way through the leaves blanketing the river. Monsoon has left the Mazaruni stuffed and with bowed trees and crisscrossed branches. I'm 16, floating in a small canoe. I dip my girl-sized paddle one side, then the other, just enough to skirt around the branches and occasional trunk. Soft mud smelling fresh from a new spring cycle hugs the bank. The lone bird high up in a tree sings its awareness with the nearby waterfall for a backup chorus. I begin to believe this moment is nature's way of listening to her own prayer. Here, stillness and sound are homogenized, and a mysterious fragrance wakes up inside of me. An hour, maybe two months, maybe a year later, I don't know, I return home. I tie the canoe to the landing, and I carry the jungle into the house. Mm. So I think we'll end with this one. This is one that Gretna really likes, so I decided to read it, even though it's not nature. It is nature a little bit. It's called Having Uncles Named Homer. <laughs> Shrimp meaning small, and for the fishermen of Cortez Village, a livelihood. For my little brother, after brain damage, brain food. He ate as many as he could stuff into his mouth. They called from the Gulf of Mexico, these noisy pink swirls. They were, they still are, louder than whales singing, dolphins talking in deep water, as sexual as bats in the air who might suck your juicy insides. These old days of segregation, we went to the Morrison's cafeteria, and my Uncle Homer paid the check with, for livelihood and brain food, all you could eat, for all of us. And the sea chattered and told our secrets. We grew and healed and learned to fly at night, live on land, drink. We told the small secrets until they grew large until they flew a few inches above our heads, until there were no secrets and we didn't need our eyes to know that shrimp screaming in the water is the loudest sound in the world. Oh, certainly. Yes. I want to do birches for Mariko, my sandin, who's here all the way from Japan. It's her uh, husband Jerry's favorite, Birches by Robert Frost. Oh. When I see birches bend to left and right across the lines of straighter, darker trees, I like to think some boys been swaying them, but swinging doesn't bend them down to stay as ice storms do. Often, you must have seen them loaded with ice a sunny winter morning after rain. They click upon themselves as the breeze rises and turn many colored as the air cracks and crazes their enamel. Soon, the sun's warmth makes them shed crystal shells, shattering and avalanching on the snow crust, such heaps of broken glass to sweep away. You'd think the inner dome of heaven had fallen. They are dragged to the weathered bracken by the load, and they seem not to break, though once they're bowed so low, for long, they never wreck themselves. You may see their trunks arching in the woods years afterwards, 
trailing their leaves on the ground like girls on hands and knees that throw their hair before them over their heads to dry in the sun. But I was going to say when Truth broke in with all her matter of fact about the ice storm, I should prefer to have some boy bend them as he would out and in to fetch the cows, some boy too far from town to learn basketball, whose only play was what he found himself, summer or winter, and could play alone. One by one he subdued his father's trees by riding them down over and over again. And I'm gonna cut to the end. May no fate willingly misunderstand me and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return. Earth's the right place for love. Thank you for letting me do that. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it going for Gretna and Eloise. Wonderful. As you know, we have some time for Q&A for them. If you'd like to come up and ask a question, uh, they'd be happy to answer. Um, Sarah, you also had something you wanted to share, right? You were going to tell us? OK. Um, and we, I will uh, start passing the open mic form around. Uh, so yeah, feel free to go on up and ask some questions. Here's a question. Not a question, compliment. Um, each one I like. It. I love the line, the heart is empty as ears are full. I love that line. I love the and then I loved your last poem, not Robert Frost, but I love that one. The other one, Nature's Way of Listening to Her Own Poem. That is so beautiful. I also like um, the poem with your family that bridges. Bridges are metaphor. Yeah. I got that. They're all very good. And your presentation was so good because I've been to other poetry readings here, and not all poets are good at reading their poems, even though they write it very well. Your presentation was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you say a few words about how cool women came about? Yeah, Gretna was not there at the beginning, but um, a, a poet named Betty Wees and another poet named Carolyn Edelman uh, said they wanted to put together a group. And the original group was seven women. Uh, Carolyn is no longer with us, but we still bring her in for things occasionally. She's more of a journalist now. And we had been meeting since sometime in the middle 90s as a critique group. And a Valentine's Day came up, and there was still, um, Macabre Books was still in existence in Princeton. And they asked us if we would be willing to do a Valentine's Day reading. We had never read as a group. And uh, so we said yes. And, I can't remember who came up with the idea of having to be hot toned by cool women. <laughs> and so we did a Valentine's Day reading, and then people started inviting us. And so we perform all over now, and, and we don't even all live here anymore. I mean, we've got people out on the West Coast, we've got people down in Maryland. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, we're, we're not even all in the same proximity. Thank you, Jesus, for Zoom. I mean, that really has kept us kept us together. And um, we didn't read at all during the pandemic. We only met during the pandemic, and then we we put out a, a new anthology. We have, I think, seven anthologies and two uh, CDs that we put out. And so we've been performing for quite a long time. The group is is getting close to 30 years old. And so we've been together a long time through sort of everything with each other. 
So is that enough of an answer? Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're we're actually reading um, in my little town of Lawrenceville um, in November sometime. You can go to our November website. November thirtieth. Yeah. And we'll all be here, which is unusual. People are coming. Well, actually, probably not Joyce. Joyce doesn't travel very much anymore. How many? But Gretna's the youngest, and I'm the next to the youngest. So there are, you know, people go up in age. How many are there? There are nine of us now. There are nine of us. And we, we expanded because we couldn't always be together. I mean, people were tiring and they were starting to travel and we, we wanted to keep going. And so now we, we sometimes perform with as little as four. But it's, it's a, a great thing. It's a, a gift of a lifetime, I think. Yeah. you want to say anything about it? Um, and then you see the, the format. It's really jazz-ish. Um, really just the, the instruments, um, which in our case is still poetry. Um, elicit responses from each other. Um, as good jazz musicians, if they come in knowing every single note, it feels like they phone it in, it's never good. So you'll see us up here, you know, changing, uh, turning a page and changing another page. We've read all the way from here, Colorado, um, Pennsylvania, Portland, we've been in Port Oregon. Portland, Oregon, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. No. I'm just curious, though, both of you, uh, being lifelong poets, how have you found, or what's the effect that you feel that poetry has had on your life? Not so much the reading it to others, appreciation, it's always wonderful, but these poems live in you, you know, uh, whoever would like to start first, but I'm curious, I'd love to hear. I, that's your son, I, you go. <laughs> <laughs> For me, oh, he gave me that one. I say, poetry is how I do life. Everything is a poem. You see a bunch of trees out there, and I see bunches of broccoli. It's just that they grew tall, way up, way up. And you look at me and think, well, that's silly, and I go, yes. That's why I'm always grinning and smiling and laughing. Poetry is how I do life. It lets you not say, take yourself that seriously and not take anything else that seriously. And I think... Uh, I've, it took me a long time to accept that being a poet is a gift because you get to eavesdrop on the secrets of the universe and then tell it. So. And that answer for me, oh, I just, I'll just throw this in quick and then you can go. That answer for me is, uh, it, it's, it's sort of ever changing. But lately I've been reading a lot of stuff by Rebecca Solnit. And she actually believes that poetry is our salvation. And I do believe that. I think that if, if human beings don't have poetry, it, the world is going to be even worse than now, which is hard for even me to imagine. I agree. And that sent me to this thought that because poetry is our salvation. Make me think, when the gods, I don't care if it's you, whether whatever is your sacred book, the Bhagavad Gita, the Bible, the Holy Quran, I don't care what it is. When they needed to get our attention, they turned to poetry. I give you, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, what? That's poetry. No washing can make anybody whiter than snow. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What? They turned to poetry because only poetry or uh, cranberry juice can be concentrated to the heart of the matter where one word gives you itself and everything else. Poetry. There's one right back there. I don't want to put anyone on the spot who don't have to answer this, but in the poem, I think it was Bridges about the son, your son who stood up to his father. Is, is it this one here? That's him. Yeah. That's the culprit. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a phenom on his own. I, I, I saved his rear end that day. <laughs> Do you remember? Do you remember? Not specifically. No. 
Well, I mean, I remember, I remember saying something like that, but I yeah. wish I was more imaginative. Yeah. I was like, let's go read. <laughs> spoken word stuff and how it was created and how it's evolved and how powerful it's become and how it's given young black men power and well all black men power black you know from babies on up it's just an amazing phenomenon and then of course in many ways the the phenomenon of Amanda Gorham and when she spoke at the inauguration I just think that it's it's just something. It's just something. So, yes, sir. I have a question for both of you. Uh, my writing group, a few nights ago, we were talking about revision. And when is a poem done? And are you ever happy with the end product? What do you think? Um, well, the one that, uh, the couplet one about the headlines mm -hmm. that uh, Gretna read. It's totally marked up right now. Oh, I mean, it's show you. Yeah, <laughs> pull it up. And uh, years ago at the Frost Place, I read with Yusef Kumanaka, and I was behind him after I sat down, and he was the star, and I was looking at his books when we'd open them, and they were all marked up. And he said he never stops revising. So I think it... You know, I have a sense that I've done everything I can at the moment, but I don't, you know, it's a it's a very open-ended kind of art form. Yeah, it's, it's this thing that comes from inside of you. It's a birth thing, if you will. And no parent ever looks at an 18-year-old going off from college saying, well, I'm done raising you now. You got to, you know, to wash your clothes and fold your drawers and, you know, put away the dishes. And, and, you know, you don't need to call me and ask me how many, you know, uh, cups of water to put in one cup of rice. I'm, well, we're done here. So they came out of you too. You're never done. And, you know, the saying, a piece of writing is never done. It's only abandoned. You get to a point and you say, kid, you're 18, bye. <laughs> and you let it go and you turn to the next one because you got some more raising to do that's it one, what's, uh, for both of you what are your favorite poems to recite uh, to yourself is it your birthday poem or if it is you mentioned another one oh, oh you mean of my own not yeah. by somebody else of your own um, probably the one that I feel like I've just finished. Yeah. You know, I, I just sort of love it the most at that moment. Yeah. I mean, I do have to say that the Warbler song, I do love that, and I love to read it. And it was actually turned into a little piece of theater, and, and I got to see an actor perform it. So it was really pretty wonderful. Yeah, the same here for favorite, the one I've just written, and then I, I put it in a folder or something, and I literally put it under my pillow at night or beside me on the bed. If I go to the bathroom, this thing goes with me. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, and the others are going, what are you doing? Because uh, it's my favorite. <laughs> you know, until, I, I mean, I do have some that I like, some, one of where there's a kid in it who is so feisty, um, called Raw Bones and Style.
because he's poor and he doesn't he stares his own poverty in the face and says, uh, I ain't scared of you. So I, I love that one. Um, but yeah, and the last one. A good question that you brought up when you were asking something different is which poems, like Robert Frost, Keats, Shakespeare, which poem um, would you say is your favorite? Or which, you know, no one could ever say which is your favorite, but that kind of, you know, we all have our poems that we love that we go back to and we say that inspired us. What would you say, both of you? Well, it, it ranges around for me. I mean, I have to say that. I know that I, as I said, I'm a recovering theater artist and I directed a lot of Shakespeare and I acted quite a bit of Shakespeare in Shakespeare festivals around the country. And I think one of the reasons I developed an ear was because of Shakespeare. So I'm sort of eternally grateful to anything that he did in verse. Mm -hmm. And then Leaves of Grass. I mean, it, it, I mean any, I mean, Walt Whitman, I mean, I'm getting chills just thinking about the guy. Love it. Yeah. There's, a, there's a book on the bestsellers list now, I'm reading it, Hello Beautiful, and the uh, writer is in love with Walt Whitman, and it's dispersed throughout the whole book. Oh, we'll have to look for that Yeah, one. no, it's, I, I forget who the author is, and I'm only halfway through it, but, it, but it's a little Walt Whitman throughout the whole book. Yeah, years ago, we uh, cool women went to Maria Gillum's festival, and we read and we we did a, a panel, and then we also went to some of the other things. And there were a bunch of like women who were youngish, who were college professors at various prestigious schools that were talking about Whitman, and I actually wrote a poem about it because I was so. I think the academic nature of what they were doing to him made me want to actually slap them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and yeah, well, Whitman, of course. But I was um, probably 12 or so in, in high school in Guyana when I read Robert Frost's The Road. Is it The Road Not Taken? Yeah. Two Roads Diverged in a Year. That poem, and I read the entire poem. And I started laughing out loud in class. My teacher said, Retna, behave yourself. <laughs> and I said, you have to see this, you have to. So she walks up behind me, she, and I, I read the poem again. And I get to the end, I said, this poem is lying. And she says, what? <laughs> <laughs> this poem that gave me, look, I have the goose pimples right now. It's so inspiring. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. He did not take the one less traveled by. He told you that, and it made you feel good, and it inspired you to get up, turn on the light, and keep on keeping on. But the poem was lying to you. Poems have to do whatever they need to do to light that fire under you. I didn't mean to write that time. It just happened. <laughs> yeah, I just, it, oh my God, I went berserk. And I started thinking of how can you say something and the person know, knows you mean something else, but you also meant that, but there's a third thing, but I loved it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm going to, um, again, give a little advertisement for myself. I do poetry discussions here at the Brooklyn Library once a month. Oh, oh cool. And I read, I don't, we don't read other people's poems. We read, you know, Robert Frost or current poets. But I always say, this is not an English class. It's how does a poem make you feel? There's no right or wrong. I do not pull the poem apart like you were just saying the professors did for yeah, women. Like, you know, like how I just don't tie it to a chair and beat it. <laughs> <laughs> I always ask them, you know, what do you like about the poem? How's it grab you? Relate to it. Yeah. So we're just about to time for the open mic, but before we do, I uh, just thought uh, if the two of you might be able to talk about what you see value in uh, having uh, two different voices or more uh, converse with one another through poetry in the way that this. Uh, 
that this lovely reading did. I think, you know, because we so often, especially as writers, uh, we spend a lot of time on our own, you know, listening to our own voice or trying to find our own voice, but then to be able to share that and, and have that back and forth, I think can be really meaningful. So I was wondering if you could talk about the ways in which it matters to you. For me, poems complementing each other like that, having that, it's like two hands clapping, one hand can't do it. So each enriches the other. Um, when I hear what Eloise is reading, um, and then it sends me to one that I could, you know, use to respond to hers. What I'm doing with mine is pulling more insight out of hers, using one poem to pull more from the other. Forget us, let the poems do their thing. So I just, I see it that way. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, as a, an activist, I think that the days of the Lone Ranger are not where we are anymore. We're, we're going to have to do this together. And so for me, it's the community aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel that on my own, I'm pretty average, but together, with cool women, I'm part of a genius. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, it, it's, I don't even think I have a language for the bond. Right. I mean, it's really, it's, um, I think that if, I think that there, that whole group of young black, mostly women, uh, that um, most of them are writing science fiction, but there's uh, Alexa Pauline Gums, there's uh, Adrian Marie Brown, I'm trying to think of some of the other names right now, and they're escaping me. They're, they're writing in that way, they're sharing in that way, and they're also creating a movement. And so with the power of the spoken word, I think any time we can be communing with one another, it's valuable and it's a path into the future that we don't know how it's going to work. We don't know where we're headed. It just feels right for me. Yeah. yeah. You know, as uh, Maya Angelou, I think, said, a, a poem is a living, breathing thing. And Gwendolyn Brooks says, we are. Life givers, a poem on, the, on a page means nothing. You can walk by it, but what power? But to pick it up and to give voice to it and add life to it and let it stand up off the page and enter our bodies, if you will. I think together, this kind of um, collaborating between works is a force. And it's more powerful than any one of us. Absolutely. And I think it's really palpable. So, And it's not something we often have done for Kevin Carey. So I just want to give you one more round of applause for, for it. It's really been a cool Thank you for being able to accept that that's what we wanted to do. I, I mean, we're so we were grateful. like, yeah, let's just do it. You know, it sounds like a blast, and here it was. So. Um, so it's like being in church with the call and response. And yes, yes, yes. You have this synergistic power that just yeah, and we're both big on church. So enhanced, yes. well, it enhanced both. Yeah, the, the interplay was great. So thank you so much. Thank you.